Yes, we can start. Okay, my friend. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not a trio. Yeah. With that.
time. service we have a a very full church which is wonderful testimony to Peter but we have run out of orders of service if it's possible for you to share with the person next to you uh, as you can see lots are still arriving I'll come around and collect any spares thank you
the only time I've seen the church as packed as this at Christmas with lots of little ones. So you are very, very welcome. It's lovely to see the church so full um, on this very sad occasion. The only announcement I would have to make, two announcements, is first of all, if you're in need of the toilet, it's through the archway and then down round to the right. In the case of an emergency, <coughs> the main exit is either there or out through the fire exit over there. If you have any problems, um, ambulatory problems, that's the best door to use because that one is stepped. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
out of the depths. I have cried to you, O Lord, hear my voice. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's a great privilege to welcome so many of you into this church which Peter loved for nearly nine centuries. People have come here with their sorrows and their joys, and he loved the numinous presence in this place. These walls have absorbed <laughs> laughter and tears, and whatever your emotions are this day, this place is here for you, and we are here for you. We meet not just ourselves, but we gather in the presence of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, in this season of Eastertide, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. And may his grace and mercy and peace be with you. We are here to remember before God our brother Peter, to give thanks for his life and to commend him to God, our merciful Redeemer, to commit his body to be cremated and to comfort one another in our grief. And so acknowledging God's presence here, let us pray. God of all consolation, your son Jesus Christ was moved to tears at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. Look with compassion on all gathered here in their loss. Give to troubled hearts the light of hope and turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven. Through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we remain standing to sing our first hymn, The Day Thou Gavest, Lord, is Ended.
please be seated as we listen to Rolf's memories of Peter. My apologies, this is a bit of a ramble, because what I did with Peter a lot, I did all sorts of other things with Peter, but we walked a lot. And so sometimes we nearly got lost. So sometimes I might get a bit lost, but what you're going to get is a mixture of some reflections of mine and some words which Peter has written. Now some of those things will spark echoes in you, I'm sure. There will be also gaps. We won't cover everything. And some of the things that I say, or maybe some of the things that I read from Peter, you will say, well, I didn't know about that, or what's that's got to do with anything? Um, so it will be a bit of a ramble, but it's an important ramble. When I heard that Peter had died, I wrote to some of my friends. I heard last evening that my so long friend and co-convener of many Pyrenean adventures, Peter, has taken his last flight. You who have shared both some of these times and also some of my stories of our journeys will know that my writing is both tears and celebration, as of course is my speaking, both tears and celebration. I miss a great friend, and we first met when we were about 14, so over a long period of time. But I also celebrate Aaron Bormack, a great guy. And I will attempt to just touch some of those spots in my memory and read some of the things that he said. I met Peter when we were about 14 or 15, and our not always quite parallel, but always sympathetic tra trajectories traversed skiffle. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. Folk and jazz, socialist activism, not a few beers in a pub in Cambridge called The Fountain, and many, many mountains in England, Wales, France, Spain, and Crete, to say the least. After the exertion, there was always intellectual passionately social and quizzically reflective interaction. All things that Peter did pretty well. Usually I cooked and he washed up. <laughs> Usually I got up the mountain quicker and he got there more equitably. You can read the word mountain in all sorts of different ways there as well. Occasionally one or other of us missed the path, but we never totally got lost though we often enjoyed reminding the other that they might have done. <laughs> he became a trainer of teachers. But then he decided he needed to go back to the coalface and do the things that he was teaching. I'm not sure I know many people who have the insight and the courage to do that. Like many of the things that he did, they remained pretty unspoken. He just did them. And they worked. He was also a classical scholar, like his dad. Uh, I remember when I went to Crete with him, it must have been in our 50s or 60s or something, he kind of dug up his old Greek and managed to communicate with modern Greeks, which I thought was amazingly impressive, particularly for somebody who said, oh, I, was never quite, I was never really very good at this, you know. Um, and he was like that. He had the same facility... Antoinette, tu te rappelles, he had the same facility with French. He always says, I'm not very good at French, but he really wanted to learn it. And he made sure he did learn it, and he used it, and he practiced it. So anything that Peter put his mind to, he had that ability always to go for it very thoroughly, to follow it through, to find out what it could give, and to use it for himself and for others, because when we were in Crete, he used it so we could go and get a coffee or whatever else it was that we needed to do, or buy some wine in the, sh in the store. Yeah? So very practical. Yeah? 
He was also, of course, as we have been reminded by the introductory music, a hugely talented and theoretically technically competent musician who just found it more fun to jam with a folk group. And he was good at it. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, he was also trained, like me, by a very practical geographer, our geography teacher at school, by walking in wild places, even at that young age. And he was unflappably good at solving quite tricky navigational issues of all kinds. I remember once being on the Broads, uh, in Norfolk Broads, in, in, a, in, a, in a rather dodgy sailboat, uh, with a guy called John Sills, who was also at school with us. And at one point... The boat started going like this because there was a, lot, a, heavy, a very strong wind and we nearly took the head off several pedestrians who were walking along the towpath. Um, Peter was totally unflappable. He knew we'd get out of it. He had the skills. Mike had the skills. We got out of it. Uh, so Peter was, again, that kind of unflappable presence. And he was very cool and he was very competent and, and courageous in those situations. He always also had a dry and witty response, which helped you to ground yourself. I'll come back to that a bit later as well. Um, but he was also always self-deprecating, ironic, non-confrontational. How many times have I been particularly glad of that when on a peaky bit in the Pyrenees? Perhaps not least when we were up in the mountains somewhere and out of an apparently completely blue sky, um, a bolt of lightning suddenly came down between us. Uh, and he was where you are and I was here. Um, we looked at each other Peter said I think we should go down <laughs> but over many years we continued to go up and down to be together in those wild places and to share them with an, un with an ever enriching and, gra and, and growing group of friends who joined us on frequent visits to the Pyrenees I'll come back to some of this in a bit, because that was a bit of me. I'm now going to segue into some stuff that Peter has written. Um, but I just want to end that bit with reflections about his, his walking him and me being aware of him walking. I went last year to Slovenia with both my sons, and one of whom had been walking with Peter in the Pyrenees on a couple of occasions. Uh, but I, I just felt at that point my, my elder son was bounding ahead um, like, a, like a goat, and he was like a sort of avatar of me when I was walking with Peter. My younger son was behind me. And whenever I had difficulty getting up anything, I knew he would be there. And he would push me. Give me a hand. Just hold me. That was Peter. I always knew that Peter had my back. And I think that probably also applies to many other circumstances. I think it applies to him in many other ways. Okay, I'll just read from some of the stuff that he's written um, and maybe just bounce off it a little bit. Peter was born in 19... father was a headmaster. His sister Elizabeth was born two years later and then Patricia a further three years after that. And of course, those people and other people who are here will... Yeah, they will remember things that, that, about this and lots of things that aren't in this writing. Um, but that's, that's how it is. Um, but those things are precious. And these are just touchstones. These are just little memories that will maybe bring that back to us. Just as when I walked up, I went out on Sunday last, just a few days ago, to walk in Runton, which was where Peter and I first did outsidey sort of things at the age of about 14 or 15 with, with the scout troop. And I didn't actually look, as it were, for places where I'd been with Peter. But as I walked, it was though my feet and my body and the way that I looked at the trees found something of him. And I think that's how we have memories. We don't have memories up here. We have memories in our bodies. We have memories in the pores of our, of our skin. We have memories in our blood. And those things, maybe we'll just touch a few of those spots. So Peter, um, growing up in, this, uh, in, in, in Maidenhead, played a lot in the grounds um, um, and did lots of reading, which he said became a lifetime habit. Indeed, it did. And he was a very diligent uh, and intent reader and a very good and analytical one as well. Um, he's a little... Sometimes he's, he's a little naughty in the things that he writes. Well, I'm going to read them, some of them anyway. Um, he said, William and Mary were good parents and taught the children the three R's, how to ride a bike and how to swim. 
Um, and they, you know, they played things in the garden. They played whist and they played badminton inside and, 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 and croquet and stuff like this. Lots of games and all things like that. But the parents weren't very child-centred. Now, that's, of course, a teacher of teachers speaking, um, and from a different generation, as it were, also, because in the, day, the generation that Peter grew up, people perhaps weren't quite that sort of child-centred in the way that they need to be or have to be these days. But anyway, um, uh, he does tell us that a relative nicknamed his mother Scout Master Mary. Um, um, so you can get the idea of this is Peter's memory of that situation, yeah? Uh, and his father found it a diff- bit difficult to, re- to forget his role as head teacher. I remember um, going to see Peter in his house, and, and Mr. Ealing, as he was then, um, his father, William, would, would come in from time to time, and he would sort of have his glasses up there, and he'd sort of look at you and say, oh, yes, you're here again, and then he'd disappear <laughs> and go back into his study. Um, so maybe that was right, I don't know. Um, but he, Peter also had uh, grandparents in Cambridge where he used to go and... and one of his grandfather's jobs was looking after boats on the River Cam. So Peter got a lot of pleasure out of doing that, about, about mucking about in boats, which was one of those things that people did um, in those days, particularly in Cambridge. Um, anyway, he, he then subsequently went to Cambridge because his father got a job as the headmaster of the Cambridgeshire High School for Boys, and Peter went to the Purse and joined in about the second or third year, I forget exactly which, um, where I was already there. Um, and he did jolly well, he was very clever, um, and he enjoyed the purse, but he particularly, he says, enjoyed the many opportunities for outdoor pursuits given by the scouts and the combined cadet, cadet force. There was climbing in Scotland and Wales, sailing in the Norfolk Broads, and best of all, an expedition to the French Pyrenees. I'll mention, I have mentioned some of that. I'll come back to a couple of other things um, as well. So the first time that we went to the Pyrenees together was in the context of what was supposed to be the senior scout troop. It was actually a climbing club because it was led by a couple of guys, the geography teacher and French teacher, who were really just interested in climbing mountains, uh, and maybe shouting at, shouting at you that, that over there, do you know what that is? That's a glacial erratic. Um, anybody know what a glacial erratic is? Um, well, look it up afterwards. Um, anyway, um, that sort of thing, that sort of conversation was to be had, but it was great fun, and we went to all sorts of weird places. Um, and during the middle years... Uh, and Peter also says that during the middle years of, of his life, he met up with me, and we used to go and visit the Pyrenees again. So that, was, that picks up a bit later. At school, however, um, he had a very good friend, Patrick Schicker, who is sitting with us, I'm glad to see. Um, and Pat introduced Peter to a way of thinking which stayed, through, which stayed with him throughout his life, progressive politics. I'm sure you won't mind me reading this, Pat. Pat's nickname at school was Bolshevik Bill. (laughs) Um, But he also introduced Peter to hitchhiking in foreign countries, uh, and they went to Vienna, and they went to Ljubljana, and so on, went to all sorts of interesting places. So then Peter uh, studied English, um, went to Cambridge, studied English with a very lively, dynamic uh, English teacher called Douglas Brown, who did a lot of drama work in English at the Perth School. Um, and was a very lively guy, but was also happened to be a devotee of the very famous at that time English critic F.R. Leavis, which was one particular way of reading books. Yeah, now, there are lots of people in academia who have particular ways of doing things, and quite often they're useful, but also they can put people down rabbit holes because you think, oh, I can only do it this way and I must do it, you know, and Peter didn't get on particularly with that, particularly when he, got, when he got to Cambridge, and he found that the teaching was not as great as it was perhaps um, supposed to have been. So his time in Cambridge was not altogether, not altogether happy. Um, but uh, anyway, after that, um, he, uh, one of the things was actually, too, that he took possibly what he got from Pat, which was this slightly bolshy attitude, and here he was in a rather posh college. Now, I can rem- never remember which way round is it Oxford or Cambridge. Is it Magdalene in Oxford or, Cam- or is it Magdalene in... Or, I don't know, one or the other. Um, anybody know? It's Magdalene in, in Ox- Cambridge. It's Magdalene in Cambridge and Magdalene in Oxford. No, it's Magdalene in both of them. Anyway, I'm getting a bit Magdalene here. I'm sorry. Um, it's just strange. There are lots of odd con- connections between... Peter and me, which had nothing to do with any kind of reality. But he went to this college, whichever it was, Magdalene or Magdalene in Cambridge, and my eldest son went to the other one in Oxford, which was much more left-wing. It was a sort of nascent place for Labour politicians, the one in Oxford. But Peter found the one that he went to full of toffs, uh, and it was a bit, 
a bit sort of gritty. Um, so he didn't altogether enjoy it. And also his grandfather, who I already mentioned, who was into boats, was actually a college servant. So you can see the political ramifications and how this didn't quite fit with the kind of person that Peter um, was beginning to be. And during this time, whilst he was at Cambridge, he also joined Pat and other people to go to Yugoslavia in the vacations, yeah? to help the Yugoslavian government, as it was then, to start to develop social services and build roads and all sorts of things, which was great, except on the last occasion, he came back with meningitis. Other coincidence, he came back with meningitis. He was hospitalised in Cambridge, and he was in hospital for a long time, and he very nearly died. Uh, coincidence, I was at the time working as a hospital porter <laughs> in Cambridge. This is how our university professors get trained. That's what you do if you want, you know. Um, that, anyway, um, that, so we, we kind of connected at that point when we hadn't seen each other for a bit. Um, and then uh, after that, subsequently, when he recovered, um, he, he um, eventually he started to, to, to get into teaching. And he got a job in, in Liverpool, just outside Liverpool in Crosby. Um, and curiously enough, either at that time, I can't remember exactly the, 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 the time, but I was in Manchester. So we kind of were following each other, not quite around for, for various lengths of time. Um, and he had a good time in uh, teaching in Merchant Taylor's School in Crosby. Um, and he learned a lot about um, teaching, um, the, the way that teaching worked, and he also played a lot of interesting music. But he then also discovered that he wanted to learn how to teach properly, so he went back uh, to Cambridge and did a diploma in education. Um, and as a result of that, got his first job in Cambridge, teaching in uh, what he obviously enjoyed, uh, uh, a, pri a, a, a primary school called Neenham Croft, um, which he said had a variety of different children, some from ordinary backgrounds, labourers and farmers and so on, but also one of them just happened to be the son of Stephen Hawking. So they were probably quite bright. It was probably quite an interesting variety of challenges. But again, he's finding his way into how do I use the talents that I have? How do I employ the way that I can relate to people? How do I understand these different dynamics and, and, and challenges um, that, are, that are arising? And he writes about his time in that school it was a paradise for a teacher. Interesting little note. And then he'd been doing that for two years, and, and he got a job after that, got a job at, in Winchester at what was then the Teachers' Training College, it's now a university, and uh, started then to teach teachers. And also found lots of, live, lots of very uh, engaging and, and, and stimulating people there, giving him a sense of what teaching was like. But, as I've already mentioned... After being there for 15 years, he decided, I'm getting a bit rusty. I'd better go back to the coalface and find out what teaching is now like, what the challenges are really like of standing up in front of a class of children and doing things and doing things cre creatively and interesting with them, not just talking about it as a theory, but doing it as a practice. So he did that, and he actually then went into a primary school uh, and became uh, subsequently, in fact, uh, replaced somebody in the school um, over a period of years. And he said it was tough, pretty tough doing that. But again, that's the sort of person that he was and the sort of way that he dealt with things. He just got on with it and did it and learned it. And he said, he writes, it was tough getting up to speed, but he learned so much from his colleagues and he really enjoyed his time there. So all the things that he's writing here are about his journey through teaching which is always being prepared to try new things, to do difficult things, to put himself on the line, to try to find out ways of relating to people and helping people and using his abilities to help people. At that point, more or less, he, he had to take, make a choice. Should he stay in that primary teaching role or should he go back to the university? Uh, and he says it was an economic choice, unfortunately. Um, the salaries were not comparable, so he went back to university at that point. Um, and at this, this kind of period of his life was the period when he was getting married to Elaine, having children, John and, and, and Eliza. And uh, they also met through their interest in folk music and dance. Yeah? Uh, and were members of a folk dance team, Wood Fiddley, uh, who performed throughout the British Isles and in Europe and appeared at many top festivals. So what I said earlier, he was a good musician. Yeah. 
didn't, he, never, he sort of he hid his lighter under a bushel. He never kind of boasted about that. But he knew his stuff. Yeah? Very good musician. He also writes here um, a, a very, very movingly about how Elaine looked after the children uh, when, uh, when they began to have difficulties, financial difficulties and other difficulties, periods. We all have periods like these in our lives. Yeah? If we could do it all right, well, maybe we, we wouldn't be here. Um, but we don't. We do it sometimes. We do it right sometimes. We don't get it quite so right. But also they had financial difficulties, difficulties with the house, all sorts of things, which Peter writes about here. But he also says... Uh, his memories, and this, this may uh, again um, relate to some things that people will remember. The family had many boating holidays a huge circular cruise in Burgundy, a trip up the Charente, a voyage from the centre of the Netherlands right into Amsterdam, that sounds pretty kind of daring, um, and another through Friesland, and an awful, an awful camping holiday in Brittany where the tent leaked and more or less everything went wrong. Well, I can remember camping holidays like that myself. They frequently do seem to happen. I remember a night spent in a car park, and cl- uh, sleeping in the car while the rain bucketed down outside with my two sons. So these things happen to us all at some point in or, or other, but they're not, they're not great when they happen, but it's great to talk about them afterwards. Um, anyway, they had those holidays, um, but after a while, the family decided it was probably better if Peter went off and did things like walking up large mountains, and they went somewhere a bit more comfortable rather than spending their time in tents that were getting rained on. Um, so they did. And Peter, during this time, um, he climbed the, the Jungfrau, he climbed the Eiger. He was very disappointed that he didn't climb the Matterhorn because it was a fault of some of the other people on the party because they kind of got into trouble and they, therefore they had to, you know, kind of go with everybody. So for a guy who, again, never presented himself as a top sportsman, as a great mountaineer, he actually climbed three of the highest mountains in Europe yeah, and didn't really talk about it very much, um, okay, apart from when I was with him in the Pyrenees and sometimes we'd ask him about it, but you know, he would never mention that kind of thing very much. Um, so that was, again, very much the sort of person that he was. Um, and after about 30 years at what's now at Winchester University, he reached retirement and was more than miffed that the Vice-Chancellor was 45 minutes late for the ceremony. <laughs> And he told her off. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to be the vice chancellor at that point, but I think you know the vice chancellor's always got excuses. They always do. They're always having to do other things. Like um, I still teach part time in a university where our vice chancellors, two of them, have spent the last year um, trying to defend the fact that they they nearly bankrupted the university. Um, so they're all good at doing that sort of stuff. They live by making excuses. So Peter, forty five minutes late, it's nothing really. But I can see why it would have would have grated a bit. Um, yeah, so he, he um, retired at that point, but he continued to do lots of things. And as you know, he did a lot of things in this church. He was always very engaged with it. He continued as a governor of All Saints School. He, uh, he, uh, he made lots of friends in the local ramblers group, continued to walk around, continued to look at walks to go on in London. He had lots of interest in archaeology and history and so on. And he would always find very interesting places to visit. And he got into studying foreign languages, Antoinette and other people, uh, and uh, he continued to develop those sorts of, of interests. So he never stopped pushing the boat out a bit, going in different directions, finding new things. Um, and that very much characterizes um, him for me. Um, the last paragraph, a bit dodgy this one, he said, what about, what about his faith? And he talks about his maternal, maternal grandmother and mother, who were both deeply religious. Uh, and also his mother, he said, used to sit in a particular seat in St. Bennett's Church in Cambridge during his near-fatal illness. Well, he actually had two quite difficult illnesses. He had this one in Cambridge that I've mentioned, and he had another one later. So for several periods, of, you know, two periods of several months, he was very seriously ill. And I'm not sure which one this was, but anyway, this, the, 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 the indication is significant. His mother used to sit in the, this place, place um, uh, when he was ill. Um, but he also asked lots of questions, because Peter never didn't ask questions. And even if he didn't ask, he never asked them aggressively, but he always asked questions. He always asked questions of himself, and he always asked questions of other people. So he, he just leaves us with a few questions. Was there really a virgin birth? Did Christ really come back to life? Was it a metaphorical way of expressing an amazing event? Did God speak out loud and clear to Peter? 
No, writes Peter. He did speak, but it was often hard to make out what he was being said. One had, one had to listen very carefully. Perhaps that's also what we were doing when we were walking in those wild places. Because walking in those wild places became something that was very much a lifeline for both of us. And we'd both gone through difficult periods where everybody does. But, but you know, when we were in those places, things, things speak to you. Not in words. Maybe in the sound of the wind. Maybe in the, the feel of the air. Maybe in just the vision that you have of the mountains. Something happens to you in those places. Um, so maybe that's, for him, what God speaking might have been. I'll just go back to my text at the end and a few notes from some other people. So I, my, my memories of him really fall into the two periods, well, the, the teenage period when we were at school and then the, the later on, 30, 40 years, when we for a long time walked together in different places. Um, and as, as I said, as a, as a musician, he was streets ahead of me. I used to play in a skiffle group, but I was the third guitarist and the vocalist and it was about you know, four or five chord stuff, um, whereas Peter was a very good musician. He knew all of his stuff. Um, but we also had this contact with music through, curiously enough, uh, you might not know this, uh, through the Cambridge Young Socialists. We were part of the Cambridge Young Socialists, and we used to meet for our meetings, our regular meetings. We used to meet in the home of Roger Waters' mum. Now, do you know Roger Waters? Pink Floyd, yeah? Roger was at the Cambridge Year High School, which is where Peter's dad was the headmaster. So we would go for our weekly Young Socialist meetings, and most of the time, as far as I remember, we studied the structure of capitalism by playing Monopoly. <laughs> Very serious stuff. But at some point during most of the evenings, Roger, and I think it was Sid Barrett at the time, would come through the room, and they would disappear upstairs. And then all these weird noises would start coming out. We go, what earth is that? What a... Of course, it became the Pink Floyd a few years later. But I'm sure, again, Peter would have recognised the musical talent much better than I did uh, because of his superior ability with music. But anyway, that was an interesting combination of music and politics into which we both um, sort of dropped at that point. Um, just a few quick remem memories, of, again, now of a couple of those early walking walking experiences with the, with, the, with the school scout group. I remember we went to Scotland, we went to Torridon, which is a very wild place in west of Scotland, and it was, um, it was so wet we had to drink, we had to dig drainage tunnels under the tents to keep the tents dry um, and put, put stones over the top of the tunnels. When we took the tents up and took the stones up at the end, we found lots of frogs. <laughs> that was a great experience. We spent most of the rest of the time cooking bilberries because it was, it was very cold and wet. So we just sort of got campfires and started cooking bilberries. Um, and anyway, that was an interesting and, and kind of very, um, one of those very sort of um, macho experiences in some way. <laughs> we also went to the Isle of Rum. Um, it's almost uninhabited wildness filled with deer and many midges. Uh, and then we went to the Pyrenees, as Peter has already mentioned. We went to the Pyrenees, and I remember walking up to a certain lake in the Pyrenees, uh, I remember the first or second night when our two uh, intrepid scout teachers, um, the, the people I've mentioned before, um, they were in a separate tent. It got rather blowy in the night. About halfway through the night, they crawled into our tent and said, do you mind if we join you? Our tent's just blown off the mountain. <laughs> so we were, we were trained in very interesting ways by these people, I think, to look after ourselves and to look after other people as well in these kind of rather unexpected circumstances. Um, and then, of course, we got into this mountain bug thing, so we started going for walks ourselves, and we also picked up on, I think, Pat's training about hitchhiking, because I can remember hitchhiking from Cambridge to the Lake District. Would you do that these days? Would you let your children and your grandchildren do that? Oh, my God, you, they, you can't imagine it, can you? Yeah, I remember getting a lift uh, with a bus, a completely empty coach. There was me and the driver. Um, great, marvellous. Um, and, and somehow we just sort of walked out of our doors, stuck our thumbs up, and met up outside the youth hostel in Keswick or wherever it was, six or seven or eight hours later. Um, so it was a bit of, let's go into the unknown. We take a little bit of knowledge. We know where it is, and we know how to get there kind of thing. We know which the roads are. But we have no idea whether we're quite going to make it or not. But again, that for me is something that was always 
where Peter came from. Yeah? Let's do it. Let's try it. I've got some skills. I've got the map. I know where we went to, went to go. And he was always the guy that had the map. Uh, and he was the guy who knew, yeah, we'll make it. In the end, we'll make it. We'll get there. Uh, because those skills were going to be available and useful to other people. And so we did that, continued to do that kind of thing. And continued to go. Then about 30 years later, Peter rang me up and said, mm, do, do, do you fancy going back to the Pyrenees? Um, and I'd been going back to the Pyrenees with my sons for about three or four or five years first walking and then skiing and stuff. And I said, yeah, well, of course, yeah, fine. And so we did, and then we never stopped. Pretty nearly every year we went back to the Pyrenees and we had various friends from teaching in his university and my university and other places come to join us, uh, and we had uh, all sorts of very interesting, yeah, very interesting um, experiences and, and times together. i just read you. I, I started off by saying, you know, I'd written to some of these friends and quoted you a bit of that. Here's some of the things, or just a few things, that some of them wrote back. And this is from my friend Roger Baines, who's a teacher of French, and his wife, who teaches literature, said, Nola and I met him once in the Pyrenees, and remember appreciating his steadiness on our walks, his sharp arguments in evening discussions, his wit, and his fierce commitment to education. That's quite a nice little um, selection, yeah? Um, and then um, from another friend of mine, uh, Carl Lavery, who's professor of drama at uh, uh, Glasgow and probably the leading drama theory research in, researcher in Britain at the moment. Um, so very, a very, uh, he's, a, he's a very nice guy and, and full of kind of normal human capacities, but he's also very, very heady and intellectual. Um, and he wrote about Peter. I was enormously fond of him. Remember him in France and Wales. He was a real human being. He always looked at me somewhat amusingly when I would launch into theories about how to run the world. The result was to bring me down to earth again. Nothing said, everything communicated. <laughs> Maybe that rings a few bells. And my uh, other uh, long-term friend of mine, Nicola, who lives in Germany but joined us frequently for uh, events in the Pyrenees, says, I have me vivid memories of our trips together. You bounding up the hills, me trying to keep up a bit, but always reassured by Peter below, doggedly bringing up the rear. Later, back at the Gite, the ensuing banter as you scored points of each other in witty repartee, the, env the enveloping warmth of his humour and his whole being. What a wonderful man he was. So those memories of other people really kind of just collate mine um, and knit into the ones that I've had. A um, couple of little, little extras. Mostly, we walked pretty, pretty steadily because we had, you know, Peter was the map man and we would get there and we would do this and it began to work. Um, but now and again, it played a few tricks. Once in the Pyrenees, walking above a certain lake, a lac d'Estaing, um, I suddenly looked and I thought, I've been here before. And my body remembered that I'd been there 30 years or 40 years before when we'd first gone to the Pyrenees and we'd actually walked up that track. I had no memory of it at all. But it happened. But again, it was just nice that Peter was there at that point, and we were able to say, do you remember that? <coughs> we were here. We were there together. We did this together. And that sort of feeling is what I have about Peter. I was there. I was with him. This was what happened. This was, these memories are in my body with him and being there, and that kind of experience. Um, and another time, a bit more tricky, this one, coming down off Snowden. We were walking up Snowden. We were coming down a path. Suddenly, Peter disappeared sideways, down a precipice. I shouted, grab something! And he hung by a clump of grass for a while, a bit like poo on the end of the balloon. You remember that? Um, about that bit? Yeah. And I, I'm not quite sure whether, whether I talked him back up or more probably he just gritted his teeth and kind of inched back up. Um, but again... Quite often, those sorts of things, you're hanging on the edge. You might drop off, you might go somewhere. But again, Peter here got himself back, and maybe the fact that I was sort of shouting at him helped him, I don't know. But there was that sense, yes, it is still possible. We can still do it. Those things are part of what life is about. Nearly falling off the precipice is what we do all the time. But we can also get back. And he always got back. Yeah. 
that's what I perhaps remember, one of those things that I remember most about him. He was always very good, as I've tried to suggest through his work, his writing and mine, at using his talents and his knowledge to help others in this way. Even later in his life, when he couldn't walk very far himself, I was immensely, immensely touched that he invited me here to Winchester, gave me his bed to sleep in, and programmed in great detail a series of walks for me to do, combining country rambles, historical excursions, and architectural information. He was like that. He would do that. And all of those things were carefully researched. They were very clearly marked and delineated. They were offered as a, as a gift without any kind of um, expectation that I would, uh, you know, think I, would, I would thank him. This was just what he did. He organized, he encouraged, he supported. He kept his face and his vision forward, outward, and upward. And my son, Simric, who I mentioned earlier, one of my, old, my eldest sons, uh, just wrote back to me when I'd notified him about Peter's death. And he said, Trusting that he's climbing a new peak now with a great view. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. We're now going to listen to a piece of music where Peter is playing the parting glass. This poem was sent to us by Jill from the poetry class, and I think it was a poem actually chosen by Peter to discuss at the very last poetry he attended. Composed upon Westminster Bridge, September the 3rd, 1802,
by William Wordsworth. Earth has not anything more fair to show. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth, like a garment, wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theatres, and temples lie, open onto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still.
The reading comes from Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. In the short space of a funeral service, how do you honour and celebrate a life so rich and full as Peter's? He had many loves, as we have been hearing about, particularly the mountain sailing, music, uh, my own conversations with him from my paid work in publishing were about literature as well as poetry. He loved this church and uh, the words of truth and beauty and justice that we try to speak here. I believe he was also partial to a glass of wine. (laughs) And in these loves, he was, I think, like the poet Wordsworth, where Dickens saw grime and squalor in London. Wordsworth, standing on that bridge, saw intimations of something bigger and more beautiful and beyond the visible world. Look at the language of that poem that Peter chose. A majestic sight, the beauty of the morning, bright and glittering. It's a kind of uh, innocence uh, uh, that goes right back to the story of the Garden of Eden. And these things make the poet's heart soar and cry out, Dear God! And I think Peter's life was a crying out Um, of wonder and gratitude. Dear God, I was reading this week of a a museum and gallery in Cambridge that I'm sure Peter would would have known about if he never visited. Kettle's Yard, it was a private uh, home of someone who'd been a curator at one of the big London museums and he'd amassed his own collection and created this uh, gallery uh, to honour art and poetry and to honour that invisible, shimmering world. And in that house, it's still open as a museum, is a lamp with an engraving in Latin, Vere Dominus Est in Loco Isto. Apologies to classical scholars here for uh, my pronunciation, which translates... In truth, God inhabits this place. And I think Peter found that to be true of all his many experiences in his life. And his loves sprang from a faith that was not dogmatic, that was never narrow or repressive, or could be reduced to simple Uh, proclamations, declarations of theology, but it gave him, and it gives to us in this church, a joyful language for expressing uh, gratitude and love for the gifts of life and for that intuition which Peter had in abundance, that everything that he enjoyed pointed beyond itself and was a sacrament a sign of a bigger reality. Something 
bigger in which we can place our own stories, a shimmer of the divine shining through material things for all who have eyes to see it. Poets and artists and musicians and mountain climbers know this to be true. They don't need telling. And I think for Peter, the world, despite its sorrows, was infused with the presence of God. Subtle and silent, yes, but I think that reaches people in a way that theological argument never, ever does. Peter was in touch with that world, and we trust that he is now in its presence, enjoying a fullness that he knew by intimation and intuition. From our reading, the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. We have heard some of the words that Peter has written. But we also write our own little gospels with our lives. And the gospel that Peter leaves with us is one of gratitude, enjoyment, and love, and trust. That is a good legacy to leave. And may he inspire the gospels that you write with your lives. Amen. We come to our prayers in the service and we will conclude them by saying uh, the Lord's Prayer together, which is printed in your order of service. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made each one of us in your image to reflect your truth and light. And you fill your creation with intimations of the grandeur of your love. And we give you thanks today for Peter and for his understanding of these things for his enjoyment of the world, for everything that was good in his life, for those whom he loved and those from whom he received love. And we thank you for the memories that we treasure today ourselves, for every moment of love and joy, every moment of life well lived, every sorrow shared, every longing for justice, every argument to make the world a better place. We give you our thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You promise eternal life to those who trust in you. And remember for good this, your servant Peter, today, as we also treasure his memory. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on all gathered here, especially those dearest to Peter and all who mourn his passing, joining us here in this church or online. Strengthen us, we pray, with the knowledge of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are tender towards your children, and your mercy is over all your works. Heal any memories of hurt or failure. Forgive us for those times when we meant to do or say something and never did get round to saying or doing them. Forgive us those times when we said and did things that we came to regret. 
Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to hear us to hear on earth. And increase in us gratitude and wonder for all the gifts that you pour into our lives through your creation, through one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we gather our thoughts into the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we stand to sing our closing hymn. It's the setting of the 23rd Psalm, but perhaps to a tune that may be quite new to you. It's got a beautiful folk quality, which is why we chose it for this occasion. And uh, it's easy to pick up, and I'm sure you'll enjoy singing it for Peter. We remain standing for the middle and blessing. We have entrusted our brother Peter to God's mercy, and now in preparation for burial, we give his body to be cremated. We look for the fullness of the resurrection when Christ shall gather all his saints and all who have loved his creation to reign with him in glory forever. And I'll invite anyone from the family or anyone who would like to come and place their hand on Peter's coffin to join me now.
Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling but one equal light, no noise nor silence but one equal music, no fears nor hopes but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings but one equal eternity in the habitation of thy glory and dominion, world without end. Amen. Peter, go forth from this world in the love of God the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who redeemed you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who strengthens you and fills your sails. May the heavenly host sustain you and the company of heaven enfold you in communion with all the faithful. May your portion this day be in peace and may you dwell in the heavenly Jerusalem forever. Amen. Amen. And a final blessing for us all. May God give you his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and those whom you love and pray for in this world and the next. Amen. Amen.